First of all, cheers. Welcome to I'm back in London, yo. Finally. Oh, there there's always nice. some bullshit going on with you. <laughs> what? What bullshit? Getting into London, always. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every time there's I travel bullshit, to London always. or anywhere else for that matter. Nowadays, international traveling for musicians is not a very good thing. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Oh, that is nice. That's some good bird. Yes. Yeah. So what we're doing here is, I have one of my friends from a YouTube channel called Calibor Works, who is a professional watchmaker. Can I call you a professional watchmaker? Um, I'm more like an amateur. A watch trying... enthusiast. Yeah, I'm a watch enthusiast. I'm, I'm, I'm more an amateur who's on the way to become pro, because I've been trying to um, fine tune my technique in the last two years, but I'm on the way to become, I want to become a pro. Uh, yeah, okay, you yeah. know what? I'm gonna light our cigars because we're going to... I don't know if the camera is going to show this, but whatever. Liga Privada 52s, we're going to pair that with, as you can see, a Woodford Reserve, which is a lovely American sweet bourbon. I don't know if this is gonna work or not, and whiskey nerds out there, please don't burn me at the stake. I'm, I just like this stuff, okay? Uh, I'm gonna light the cigars, and meanwhile, you can tell me a little bit about your YouTube channel, how you got into watchmaking and all that kind of stuff, because you never told me, actually, how you started making watches. Um... Well, that's a long story. Yes, we're using a Zippo to light the freaking cigars. Don't crap your pants. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, I got into watchmaking uh, towards the end of the year 2020. Uh, you know, the pandemic and, and what happened really opened uh, a gap and had a lot of free time. So, I got into investigate first watch molding. So, I wanted to know how you can modify a watch. Yeah. Us, just like everyone else, I started with Seikos, I started with 6497s, six, 6498s, six, six, nine, nine, uh, Swiss movements. Then I started getting deeper into how to build a movement in, in the last... Uh, Keep in mind that my channel years. doesn't really contain watch nerds. Explain what the movement is within a watch. So a movement is the machine <laughs> Come on. that moves and <laughs> provides the movement to the watch. So, well, I have a good example here. So. Is that translucent watch? Maybe a little bit later on you have to, uh, can, uh, yeah, yeah. can take uh, close-ups. close, close So this is a watch that is translucent pretty much. It's it was what it's called in the industry uh, a skeleton. So this is an Edox Delphine Meccano. So in this kind of watches you can see uh, the machine if you like. That's you can see movement. everything that's happening inside everything the Everything that is happening inside, that's the movement. Um, it's like when you have um, one of those cars, like an Audi R8, that you can see the engine mm -hmm. through a glass in the back. That's pretty much a skeleton watch, so you can see the, the movement, the engine. So that's what a movement is. Um, all, not all movements are the same. Different brands use different movements. Uh, some movements are custom or house-made. So those are the most expensive watches. <laughs> um, so what I started doing in the last two years was to get to customize pieces. So find pieces like Seiko's and build watches with different colors, try to source um, the parts. Yeah, but how, how does this whole thing start? Why, why is the affinity to watches specifically? The affinity to watches is because watches talk. And in my case, I never owned a watch until I was 18 years old. I didn't like watches. 
Uh, so one day I got one as a gift and, and it just fascinated me how, how it works inside. So I just, okay. just want to learn more about watches. And in a few, um, a few years later, through my trips and, and through a, a business encounter, let's say business attempt I have with Switzerland, I got to know a little bit more the industry, knowing from inside. I'm not going to elaborate more into that. It's just that from that point, I... I oh, look at me, Mr. I became, Mysterious here. <laughs> I became more motivated <laughs> into, into customizing the pieces. I'm not a full watchmaker in the sense that I elaborate the movements, but I know how to put them together. So the watch build is what I really like. Um, in my business life, what I am is um, I'm, a, I'm a management consultant. So what I do is I provide the structure to these programs uh, to, to, to businesses. So to, I provide the structure to these, to these businesses. I provide structure to these programs to uh, roll out a certain technology. So building a watch pretty much appeals to my nature. Okay, so it's what I do. It's a pro it's a perfect project. Yeah, so basically, what you're saying is like your analytical mind has been fascinated by watches for a long time now, and now that COVID has freed up a bunch of free time, you actually started getting into this. Yeah, I started getting into this. Uh, one day I built a watch. The next thing I know, I just put, um, I had absolutely no interest in social media, so I'm kind of an introvert. <laughs> so I yeah, yeah. Tell me how your channel got blown up with a couple thousand subscribers, like. Uh, over a course of a couple of months? I built the watch. First, I, 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 put, I put a few pictures in Instagram. The people started to like it. It was nothing out of this world. It was just a Seiko, a custom Seiko. Then uh, I just started having people asking me to build them a custom Seiko. I just, well, I had no idea. I just, I just wanted to build them for myself. Then one thing then led to another and the, the designs became more and more complex. So. I started not only with Seikos, but then I, through contacts I have in Switzerland, I started getting the parts for, for real Swiss parts, 100% Swiss parts. So I started getting into the world of the 6497 movement and the 6498, which is uh, this baby. Just in case, I'm going to subtitle and insert photos somewhere in the frame so that you guys actually know what he's talking about. Yeah, there are shots on my channel so you can you can see. Yeah, also check out Caliber Works. And started giving them names. So each project has a name. This is Code Red. It's an entirely red watch. Um, oh, you didn't tell me you gave every project a name. Every before. project has a name. So I have built things like Mako. I have, thing, I have built things like Poseidon. This is Code Red. Um, Due to, um, well, I had a, some health issues in the last months. So I had to stop editing and launching videos. Uh, but now that I'm gonna have a little bit of free time and, and I'm better than uh, Caliber Works is going to come back by the end of September. Uh, very nice. So, yes, I had a, a very good reviews. I have a lot of followers. Um, I didn't expect to have this much uh, follower base in Latin America. Um, apparently, Latin America is um, it's a new world for, for watch making or watch molding. So all of a sudden I had a big reception. People really, they send me a lot of messages every day asking me how to do this, how to do that, where to source the parts, how can I make a watch my way. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't expect to have that kind of <laughs> coverage and those many people just following me. Um, these days... Uh, to be fair, nobody actually really does. The first time people start pouring into the YouTube channel or any social media for that matter, it always feels weird, doesn't it? Yeah, it feels weird. I had no intention of jumping to social media or to do this into a business. It's not a business for me. It's not a yet, hobby. Anyway. <laughs> no, yeah, well, it's a hobby that I'm just taking to the next level and slowly I just, I just, I just love making watches and I like the, the feeling of um, not only collecting them, I have a collection now. Uh, uh, As you can see uh, per the table, this is not even like a quarter of the collection. Uh, no, it is. <laughs> um, but um, yes, the, the, the fascination I, I develop for building them. Just, just to know that you're capable of doing this if you're careful enough and you fit develop the technique. I have read. Yeah, yeah I know. At I, this point, I, I have read exactly counted, count, countless watchmaking books. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, man. Um, it turns into obsession after a while, doesn't it? Turns especially, into if you, if, especially if you actually enjoy doing it. In one of the things that, that, that you learn, um, I think if you want to understand something, 
you need to understand how it was made. You can reverse engineer things and that works with pretty much with everything in life. Um, in my projects, when I want to shape, in my, my, in my business, when, when I want to shape up how it's going to look uh, in the next phase or some a program is being handed over to me, I need to reverse engineering to understand what is wrong so we can improve that part. A, a watch is the same, so when I've been building watches, when I've been finding sources of pieces, when I've been talking to people who are infinite, infinite times more qualified than me, legendary watchmakers as well from Switzerland, um, that teaches you a lot of the tricks of the industry. So inevitably, you are walking down the street and you see a guy wearing a watch, you... you it's the same thing with me <laughs> making videos. Granted, I'm not very good at making videos yet, but like as soon as I got my first camera, which we're making this video with, and I started, it was like buying a DLC to life. You know what I mean? Like after a while, when you get on a public transportation, like a bus or a train or anything, you unwillingly start paying attention to lighting, how people look in certain fluorescent stuff, how compositions work and everything. And sometimes you're just walking around the street and you're going like, I wish I would have my camera right now. On top, on top of that, pardon my, my, I don't know, maybe it's an off topic, but you're a musician. Yeah. So you understand when skilled music has been written. Something oh, yeah. is skilled, right? So it's the same with watches. When you start building watches and investigating and put them then together, then you understand the quality and the immense amount of work that it takes. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the other thing. Like, the more you know about a certain subject, the more you appreciate people who are better than you in that specific subject. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like whatever, you, you know, the the unexpected rise of Lorna Shore, just to talk a little bit about metal, because that's why we're here mainly. We're playing UK Death Fest tomorrow with Flash Girl at 1835, and Diego is coming to the show. These guys are because, awesome, by the way. Yeah, and uh, he never saw me play live, so this is going to be a first occasion at the Underworld uh, in Camden. Uh, but yeah, it's like, when, whenever you see somebody like Will Ramos, you know who I'm talking about from Lorna Shore. Like, Insane. Like the technicality wow. and the intricacy that dude does extreme vocals with, it's uh, literally incredible. It's, it's insane. And the more, the more you listen to stuff like this and the more variety you hear, the more you realize how little you know about this, this thing that you've been doing for like more than a decade. It's, it's, it's insane. It's incredible. For me, it's good. It's a refreshing experience to find more and more skilled uh, people. In, oh, don't get me in wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that in a negative way. It's actually amazing. Like, no, that, that's one of the things I love about metal and deathcore and all those subgenres. It, it, it always has, you know, metal music always has a way of surprising you. And it always has a way of somehow renewing itself. There's always something new to do. There's always something new to hear or play or, you know, the possibilities are literally endless. And I guess the same thing applies to watchmaking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said, for me, watchmaking is the best. It's a perfect project. It's a project. It is what it is. And if you screw up one step in the process, I guarantee you the watch is not going to work. <laughs> so, yeah, it's precision. It's the art of putting the right parts together to build a piece. Yeah, definitely. And, and again, I just, just like to make them for myself and, and to have the pride of wearing a part. I'm, put, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm wearing a piece that I put together myself. Yeah, yeah, that must be amazing. I mean, granted, I never made a guitar for myself, but I, I, I can kind of, kind of imagine how that feels like. Oh, I'm <laughs> starting to get into a guitar customization. Oh, yeah. So well, that's on our project. So let's play first, would you? <laughs> I've been bugging this guy for more than a decade to learn guitar so I can jam with him because he... You have an instrument. You have had it for years. Guilty of charge. And you never used it. Guilty of charge, Your Honor. No question yeah. there. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that I'm getting more and more into guitar, um, then um, I would like to enter the world of guitar customization. In the meantime, I already customized a guitar before I start playing it. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Which is really ironic. But, but yeah, um, having constant stuff. <coughs> Sorry. But that's basically how your brain works. Like before you start actually using something, you need to feel that it's your own. Isn't it? Yes. Like, that's the thing. Uh, the reason I don't like to buy secondhand watches, don't get me wrong, uh, huge respect, for, huge respect for, for the gray market and everyone who likes to buy watches. Um, I don't like to wear somebody else's watch. What is a gray market? The gray market is when authorized dealers, um, I'm not going to come into that topic about which brands I'm talking about, but is when um, there are people specializing in buying watches directly from the authorized dealers, then mm. waiting for the supply to um, 
to end. Oh, so, so, so the supply diminishes and they sell it for a profit. Diminishes and, and then they will sell it with a markup 20, 30, 40, well, 50, I learned 100%, something today, whatever they sure. want, and make them super expensive. So, so um, yeah, but on any level, whether it's a watch that is $100 or it's 50,000, uh, I don't care. I don't like to wear somebody else's watch. So yes, I have watches that I bought from That's my authorized dealers. It's a personal preference, yes. Uh, but as long as I can design and have my mind, it's, it's, it's something that really relaxes me to design the color, um, put together the elements, the color, uh, which indexes we're gonna have, the hands uh, open or close back, is it gonna be a diver, is it gonna be, um, what kind of watch is gonna have, I mean, the the, the, um, the bands. The band is gonna be metal or is gonna be steel, is gonna be a rubber, metal. all that. Always metal. All that. So I just like to put those elements and then bring I love the enthusiasm you have to this whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, bring, bring, bring that vision to fruition to make it happen. So what are your plans for this whole thing? My whole plan is... Just keep, keep doing this and as a hobby until it, I don't know, turns into something else or... Um, for time being, yes. Uh, although I still have a strong base in Instagram. People uh, asking me to build watches for them. I've already had a, a few clients. Uh, I will continue to do That's so awesome. for the Swiss pieces. Um, and uh, well, we'll see where it takes it, but, but I want to master it first before calling myself a full-blown watchmaker. Yeah, I get it, I get it. A profession that takes an infinite amount of time and, and, and skill and dedication. There, there's no cap to skills. That's the thing. And I, I actually had a conversation a couple of days ago with one of my musician friends. Like, I, I firmly believe that the only reason I still enjoy making music and playing shows and going on the road and doing everything that's related to it is like I'm never, never satisfied with myself. You know what I mean? And it's kind of a driving factor to always become better. I, I can watch like a YouTube video I made two months ago or a performance that I did a couple of months ago live and I just go like, oh my god, I was so bad. And yeah, that, that's kind of a driving force for like, I think for creative people, not necessarily for everyone. Everybody has different motivations, but in general, for me, that's a very big part of who I am and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Also, it's fundamental to have um, the ability to recognize uh, um, mentors along the path. People who oh yeah, are, definitely. People who are either more qualified or, or qualified or have more experience than you and recognize um, what kind of constructive criticism they are giving you. Yeah. So absorb that and and then make it your take own. it hard, make it your own, and see how it can you can can you apply that to uh, better your skills. Everything can be can be done with in the enough amount of dedication and time. Yeah, definitely. I think Louis C.K. said once that uh, you know the longer the longer you pursue something, the more it becomes part of yourself. So that's the reason, like. I used to have conversations with like like this with a lot of people. Like, do you ever consider it a mistake to dedicate your life to like one thing? And I actually don't. I think I'm super super lucky for one very simple reason. I knew very early in life exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I was like at age 14, 15, the first time I heard metal music. I believe like the first thing I ever learned on guitar was like Enter Sandman. I had this really crappy Soviet acoustic guitar that my grandma bought me somewhere, I don't even know. And I just practiced until my, my hands were fucking bleeding and stuff. It was an instant obsession and it hasn't let go ever since and I hope it never does. No, I don't, I don't think that's the case. It's, it provided me with a lot of good memories and uh, gave a lot of meaning to my life. And now you're hanging out and playing for Fresh Crawl. Yeah. Nice. No biggie. <laughs> No, man, it's still surreal. You know, I've been part of the band for more than a year now. Like, we actually played our first show together uh, last year at Upstate Extreme in July. I, literally, the last year was like two seconds. Everything is happening so fast and everything is growing and blowing up so fast that I literally cannot keep track of it. It's so weird. It causes a little bit of a cognitive dissonance, if you know what I mean. Like, when you're on the road and you're surrounded by all of these people and you're doing what you love to do and you, like, people actually appreciate what you're doing and then you have to go home to your regular job, you know what I mean? Because I'm not doing this for a living yet. I'm balancing a full-time job at home, my career with Flash Crawl and my other band too. So it's kind of weird. It's no. kind of like living a double life, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> yeah, no, no, but, but, but something that I really, really, um, I'm proud of. I'm proud of, about being your friend as well. 
is that I totally respect that you are doing what you love. Not everyone can say that, I guarantee you. This conversation suddenly got really deep, didn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is with the whiskey. not a problem. Yeah, whiskey always helps a conversation along, along with, if, especially if you have privadas. <laughs> um, and I think actually this cigar in the Woodford Reserve was a pretty good pairing, man. Yes. I like it. Yeah, this is the distiller I have a bunch of, I'm not going to show these and turn around the camera, I have a bunch of whiskeys from all the scotches, Irish, all the whiskeys that he could have Yeah, chosen. by this point, he I think the viewers kind of kind of gathered that yeah. we, we like uh, quality shit. And for this cigar, yeah, it's okay. What do you mean, okay? It's a Liga Privada, come on. It's a very no, good No, I mean the, the, the pairing. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. It's fine. Cheers, I'm very happy to be back in London. Cheers. Um, what's our plan for the rest of the day, I guess? Uh, yeah, the other guys from Flash Girl are currently at our hotel, which is not ready yet. So they already started drinking, as we did. <laughs> Probably we're gonna finish up this interview and then we're gonna head up into the city, hit a pub, do some mischievous things. Uh, we also have a couple of friends joining us later. You're gonna meet them all in the interview because I am going to make a vlog and I'm going to annoy everybody with my camera as I usually do. Yes. Um, so bad that you cannot take me to that lemonade stand from last time. Oh yeah, the crowbar. Yeah, the crowbar unfortunately closed its locations. I don't know if you uh, guys It's called the crowbar. That. Okay, here's the story. Yeah, yeah. Here's the story, people. So oh yeah, tell that story. Tell the story. Oh That's gotta God. be fine. Okay. So this guy, my thing with, with, with a group of friends, right? A bunch of metal heads. All of us, we go to this place called the crowbar. I don't know what's going on, sit down table, and they bring this big jar of yeah, lemonade. Yeah, the pitcher was like this big. It was big. a pitcher, it's a huge yeah, pitcher of lemonade. Everyone was just talking. They well, just at least you believed the at the time it was lemonade. Yeah, they said, oh, I thought, they did. <laughs> yeah, of course. These guys are just being courteous, they didn't bring me a beer. They just, yeah, I had a beer then too, but uh, yeah, I but left the, it then. The, and say, okay, yeah, they want to, well, I want to share lemonade. Oh, I want to have a glass of that. Oh my God, this is delicious. I want another one. And I, until I had the whole pitcher. Uh, I was just walking around and then somebody turns around and says, hey, where did the cocktail go? Yeah, and, and the cocktail. dude was I like, glass. hold on, that was not lemonade. No, that was Long Island iced tea. Oh my God, that lemonade Like a two and a half liter pitcher of that thing. Oh my God, that lemonade was great. Dude, and you were lemonade. also having shots of Jägermeister with us and drinking beer. Yes. So next day, the dude was like, oh my God, I'm so hungover. Yeah, no wonder you had two and a half liters of fucking Long Island iced tea. What that was in that lemonade? lemonade? <laughs> no, it wasn't no. lemonade? No, it was not. What was in that lemonade? Dude, we should seriously make a YouTube channel that is all about just us drinking whiskey, smoking cigars, and telling stories like this. Oh yeah. Why not? <laughs> Tell, uh, for example, the, uh, the legend of or first encounter, or first oh night my out God. in Budapest. Dude, how <laughs> delightful. When was, that was like 15 years ago? 15. How long have we known each other? I mean, Holy like it's forever, shit. but like when? When did like we 12 years ago, like, 12, 12 years ago. At least 12 years ago. At least 12 years ago. Yeah, 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 something like that. Jesus Christ. Yeah, the first encounter, I'm gonna tell this story because it's fun. Uh, bottom line, we started working at an IT company together. We were both broke, whatever. And I was young and needed money. That's a different story. <laughs> You're confusing reality with porn again. I was young and needed the money. Yeah, so one night after uh, the afternoon shift we did, I was like, yeah, you want to go have some drinks? Yeah, so we went to this very elite establishment in Budapest, <laughs> which was called the Centrum Schurze. Yeah. Hungarian viewers, you're going to know what that is. And they had this real deal Russian vodka, Stalichnaya. Russian viewers, you're going to know what that is. Bottom line, I ended up cleaning up this guy's from the floor of the pub at like three o'clock in the morning. And for quite a while, his wife hated me with a burning passion. <laughs> Are you going out with Boris again? Yes. Why? <laughs> Why, did she ask? Yeah. Why are you friends? Why are you friends with that metalhead? Yeah. So, I think we've done like 20, 20 something minutes of talking. I'm really excited for tomorrow. Well, I don't know if tomorrow, uh, to, tomorrow, uh, today, tonight, I get to to meet Flesh Girl. Don't act like we're huge rock stars or something. <laughs> but yeah, tonight, yeah. this guy is gonna meet Flesh Girl. Tomorrow, he's coming to the show. We're gonna be at Camden Underworld. Of course, I'm going to be documenting everything. But I guess we're done with this interview for now. We're gonna finish our cigars. We're gonna yeah. drink the whiskey. Time, time, time for a, a, a little uh, advertising. 
Steel Panther, if you're seeing this video, I love you. <laughs> With all my heart, I got this in the in the in, in the in the. Dude, I the wish the guys from Steel Panther amazing. would watch this. <laughs> I really wish. Steel Panther, if you're seeing this, I love you. <laughs> Contact me to your, my YouTube channel, and I'm, I'm I'm make you watch this for free. For all of you, I love you very much. Hey, there's an offer. Best fucking band on the planet. I love those guys. All right, we'll see you in Lovely a couple of hours when we head into the city. Cheers, everyone.